On today's show, the San Diego Padres get their first series win of the year after trouncing the Chicago Cubs by a score of 10 to 2. The offense explodes. We're going to recap that as well as, unfortunately, a little bit, but we'll try to keep it positive. The one loss that they had of this series, lots to dig into. Uh, let's get started. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres Podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, right? Wednesday, April 10th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, that's J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres, or Locked On Padres on the old YouTube. You can get the show wherever you get your podcast from. You might be familiar with me. If you don't know who I am, look, man, I write stuff sometimes. Over at JustBaseball.com, where you can also find my show, Baseball vs. the World, which is a little bit more general, fun baseball topics, if you want to check that out. Today's episode... Guys, we are recapping the last two games of this three-game set against the Cubs. Firstly, the fun one. Don't get me wrong. We will not. I'm, I'm, I know you're watching, Mr. Robin Murdy. Don't worry. Not going to spend too much time on the one loss of the season, but we will still discuss it. Um, a nice offensive performance. Some cool things happened. And it's just a nice way to end the series, uh, I think, overall. And that's why I waited to do this episode, because I wanted to you know, be able to do a recap for both games. And especially considering that uh, Tuesday's game... Uh, not a lot happened. Let's just be honest. Not a lot happened in Tuesday's game, especially after just the just the unbelievable miracle that was the Monday night game in which the Padres turned into a supernova. It was awesome. But folks, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Ladies and gentlemen, we love eBay Motors very, very much. They are fantastic and lovely from brakes, to exhaust kits and beyond. eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive with all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to bring home that big win. Keep it alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Let's get right into it, shall we? Let's just do it. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. The offense explodes Wednesday, folks. Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night, whichever your time zone is. More night so for me. Uh, the Padres win this game by a score of 10-2. to 2, And it is a, a genuine team effort, similar to the effort that they had um, on Monday night, except not a eight run comeback. Uh, instead that they basically had their foot on the pedal the whole time. Kyle Hendricks, not a very good pitcher um, for the Chicago Cubs. He had like a, a, a stretch Kyle Hendricks, where he was like one of the most underrated pitchers in the sport, basically up until 2021. But like the first, like one, two, three, four, five, six, six seasons of his career. He was pretty solid. Like quietly had like some of the best ERA numbers that you'll find. You know what I mean? He was more of a ground ball pitcher. Even still, uh, he was very effective, but these days he's like in his like Patrick Corbin of the nationals era, where it just seems like he's tossing too much. That's easily hittable. Although he wasn't terrible last year, 3.74 ERA Padres kill him in this game, multiple home runs off of him. And it was great. Um, but I, st- I want to talk first about Dylan Cease, who in this game goes six innings, giving up only two hits, Two runs, but none of them earned thanks to a Hassan Kim error. And more on that in just a second. Uh, two walks and seven strikeouts. His ERA on the season is 2.16. And more importantly, and more impressively, 0.84 whip. He's just not allowed, allowing a lot of hits. The most hits he's allowed in a start this year is four, and it was against the Giants. And even in that game, he still struck out seven. He's been solid. And I think that there's nothing really all that shocking about Dylan Cease thus far. Um, this is kind of who he is. Now, don't get me wrong. He does have some pitches where you're like, huh? What? You okay? You know what I mean? But he's looked really sharp for this team this year. And he actually touched out at at one point, I think 100 miles per hour. Like for one of the pitches, he was 99.6, it says in Baseball Salon. So he was like right there. Um, his velocity was actually up for all of his pitches, believe it or not. His fastball was up by 1.6, 2.4 by the slider, and 2.7 by the knuckle curve. I know that he usually is, you know, he relied more on the fastball this game. But even still, like that was... That was really cool. You know what I mean? Like, that was really impressive. And basically, with the exception of the error that Hassan Kim makes, uh, and then he makes a mistake to, uh, I believe it was Christopher Morrell, again, who kind of hurt the Padres, or Michael Bush, I'm sorry. Christopher Morrell was the night before, the Grand Slam um, that came in, and we'll talk about that later. Um, Michael Bush homers allowing Christopher Morrell to score. That's what it was. Um, but aside from that, 
like really good. And he would have been able to get out of the inning if not for a mistake by Ha-Sung Kim. It's worth pointing out, Ha-Sung Kim already has three errors on the year, had only four last season. What's going on with Kim? That might be a question some of you are having. Well, I wouldn't fret. He has looked weird. Don't get me wrong. You had the weird. Now, I think from the San Francisco series, some might bring up when the ball got knocked out of his glove. I think you can make the argument that Cronenworth should have thrown to him first instead of stepping on first and then throwing to him. I think that's probably a harder play. But even still, it's a little bit of a mistake. Just a weird, flunky, you know, dumb Padres baseball type of play. Um, But I haven't seen anything from Kim that suggests that he's losing a step. Frankly, with his defense, this is still a gold glove caliber player, and he's been that way even when he wasn't very good his rookie year. He's been an excellent defender. I mean, he had like, what was it, like eight defensive runs saved his rookie year? Like, Hassan Kim's a beast, man. Like, when it comes to the glove, he's awesome. And you have to remember that, you know, for those who might not be familiar, errors really just don't tell the full story um, with offense. It just doesn't. You know what I mean? And so far, he's still in the 97th percentile and outs above average. Like, he's still got the speed. He's still got the range. He just made some mistakes. For those who don't remember, also, Tatis, when he was playing shortstop, got a lot of flack for the errors. And then low-key, like, graded out as a decent defender, actually, by the end of the year. You would get a lot of slander from Dodgers fans. Um, Meanwhile, Corey Seager for the Dodgers was horrendous, right? Like, Tatis was making a lot of throwing errors. But basically, what I just to sum up the point, errors don't show you the full thing. Because in order for you to have gotten to the ball to make a play, that seems to be something that matters a whole lot more than instead of you just going, like, one, like, you know, 10 inches to your right and 10 inches to your left, and you were able to make the throws all year. Well, it's a lot easier when you're not moving. So, not worried about Kim. It's just fluky weirdness. I don't think he's going to randomly become awful. Does this mean he might not be the gold glove defender this year? Yeah, potentially, because there's a lot of good gloves at shortstop. You've got Francisco Lindor. You've got Dansby Swanson of the Cubs, who I believe won last year. Like, There's a lot of good gloves out there. That's all this means to me, so not concerned with Hassan Kim's defense. But back to Dylan Cease. Uh, Look, it was discussed after the trade. This has been assumed. I think everyone listening to this podcast or watching this podcast knows he's kind of like Blake Snell. He's going to have those starts where you're like, wow, the control's really weird. But when he's on, he's on. And I think that Blake Snell, I think, has shown that his upside is greater. However, his inconsistency and not going as long into games can also be greater. So that's why, in a lot of ways, I think Dylan Cease is a better pitcher. I think it's a great replacement and a great move by Preller, uh, you know, considering that they knew they were going to lose Blake Snell. And I, by the way, I think Snell's going to be good. I just think that. You know, he's going to have those starts maybe for a little bit where you're like, oh, my God, he only went three innings today. What the heck, man? Like, what, what what's going on with you? You look good in those three innings, but why is it taking you 70 pitches here? So we'll have to see how that goes. But Cease, really, really strong start to the year. And with Spencer Strider out, and I know some people might be saying, oh, he's a he's a strikeout and FIP merchant. I think that Spencer Strider was genuinely the best pitcher heading into this year for the National League. And if he's got that UCL sort of injury, then I think the the Cy Young is a lot more wide open than I think people might realize. So we'll see. It would not surprise me at all. Dylan C's finished second not too long ago, and he's on a better team, more motivation, all that stuff, better defense. Really good start by him. So let's not forget that so far on the year, he has been awesome. And even these two runs that he gave up were not um, earned. So shouts to Dylan C's. He has been awesome so far. And that means a lot because I know Padres fans, including myself, Get very nervous about any new player they bring in, even if they're a superstar, because everyone seems to have struggle um, significantly more when they hear. More so on the batting side, but even still, very nice to see that from Cease. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the rest of the game, though, uh, guys, and some of the offensive performances that we saw. It was fantastic and great and lovely. We'll get into that in just a second, guys. But before we do that, I just want to take a second to talk to you guys about a new sponsor, and that's the good folks over at Policy genius folks look life insurance is is an important thing obviously ladies and gentlemen you know what i mean and you want to have that safety net for your family and whatnot and trying to find that policy it can be very time consuming and stuff but policy genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace it saves you time and money so you can provide your family with financial safety and a safe safety net starting today uh, with Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. And look, um, yeah, 
I mean, this is important stuff, guys. So check out Policy Genius. They do a really good job comparing, you know, top options from other companies and what have you with plenty of licensed experts on hand to help talk you through all of it because this can be obvious obviously or life insurance guys obviously this could get a little bit complicated talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the process step by step easily compare quotes for america's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest prices folks really cool stuff check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with policy genius head to policygenius.com slash locked on mlb or kick, click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save that's policygenius.com slash you guessed it, locked on MLB. But we're not done yet, folks. Now we're talking the old standby. We love them very much over at eBay, folks. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors is here to help you out. Everything you need, superchargers, exhaust kits, LED headlights. What else do they got here? And more. They say and more. What? I've seen like new carpet. They've got all sorts of stuff on eBay Motors. I've checked it out myself, even though I'm not necessarily a car expert. You know what I mean? I'm not one of them driver. You know, uh, what, what does Vin Diesel say in the Fast and Furious movies? You know, a quarter mile of the time or whatever. I'm not like that. I don't know much about cars, but they help keep you updated. Easy, whatever's compatible with your um, vehicle. They help you out with eBay guaranteed fit every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and ho bring home those huge wins the same way Fernando Tatis Jr. and the Padres just did recently, guys. Keep it alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. And just like that, we're back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. We're thriving, we're vibing, and we're talking now some offense. The fun stuff, folks. Mm. One thing I did like about this game is that the Padres, after having a really disappointing Tuesday night game, they come out and start swinging fast. Um, with RBIs from in the bottom of the second inning from Luis Campizano and Jackson Merrill hits into a fielder's choice, but I'll take it. You know what I mean? Believe it or not, the Padres didn't actually hit the ball like significantly harder uh this wasn't like a game where you had all home runs or anything like that because that's kind of what happened on monday like it was a lot of big home runs you know you had the tatis home run you had the cronenworth home run you had the bogarts home run all that stuff not as much of that actually some of the hardest hit balls in terms of the top what is the six hardest hit balls of the day they five of the six belong to cubs the only one that belongs to the padres is manny machado when it was a single with a really bad launch angle that just squeaked through right so this is actually like a just a very like vintage baseball performance by the Padres. You get a home run from Jake Cronenworth in this game. I can't say enough about this guy. I really can't. 30 out of 30 ballparks, it would have been a home run. This is not luck. I just can't say enough, man. He's been phenomenal. And by the way, what I really like, this does say a lot, is that Michael Bush does hit that home run after the Hassan Kim error, and then the Padres strike back immediately. First, you get a Jerks and Profar double. And no, I, I tweeted this out. Jerickson Profar, I don't under you need to you need to spill the tea. I don't know what it is and why he's it's only him and Gary Sanchez, and I'm not exaggerating at all, are some of the only players that I have seen that have come to the Padres and gotten better offensively, right? Because and Padres have had some good offensive players, right? But I'm saying that usually people who come to the Padres seem to get worse or they stay the same. Machado, his first year, was bad. Tatis had a down year last year. Uh, Xander Bogarts is still an issue that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, all these players. Brandon Drury, Josh Bell, Adam Frazier, Mitch Moreland. They seem to – and I don't think it's necessarily a scouting talent thing because even Soto struggled for like a month and a week or so last year when he first got to the team. And then the year before at the deadline, he actually wasn't good for the rest of the year. So it took him some time. You know what I mean? So like, and I think that it was a little bit more mental and like fluky. He's, he's wants out. He's good. But even still there's, for whatever reason, Padres batters just seem to get worse. Jerkson Profar and Gary Sanchez are the exceptions. He hits a double in this one. Absolutely smokes it. Like absolutely smokes it. 940 expected batting average. The funny part about this inning, the bottom of the fourth is that, Everyone liked hitting for some reason into like um, right center field. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Like every like it was like four straight hits that went to right center field. I really really enjoyed that. Um, it was also we got a uh, unfortunately Jerickson Provar did 
hit the double and then get thrown out at third because he was pushing it too much. I appreciate the the uh, the aggressiveness though. And then Hassan Kim, he hits a triple. He hustles, and I guess they didn't learn their lesson, so he goes to third. Um, Luis Campuzano gets a ground out, but he already had an RBI at this point. Campuzano on the night, um, two RBIs again. I think it's going to calm down a little bit. I do. Um, it's already been calming down a little bit to start. But the key to remember, as always, I'm not trying to, this is a little bit like obvious, but by catcher standards, the offense is amazing for Luis Campuzano. And I've been yelling about this for years, the Campuzano hive, blah, 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 blah. This is why. Give your young guys a chance, man. Give your young guys a chance. Now, don't get me wrong. Campuzano does have some issues. The defense has looked a little bit concerning, um, specifically when it comes to framing and blocks and all that stuff. In terms of blocks above average, he's in the negative four in terms of that so that's not good that's the first percentile and in framing he's in the 18th percentile so he's actually done a decent job at some called strikes he hasn't been as bad there but even still overall he's been a minus defensively and don't get me wrong I'm not thrilled with that but um, he has hit really well so far and I think it's going to continue for the most part I think he will be an above average offensive catcher like for sure I think he'll be like one of the best offensive catches in the National League. The problem is going to be the defense. Um, and this is why having Kyle Higashioka on this roster is really important and really good. Um, because unlike Austin Nola, before anybody responds to me saying, then why were you complaining Nola was starting? See, we wanted defense. Nola wasn't good a, a good pitch framer particularly either, and he got a bunch of players were running on him and stealing bases. So that was my issue with why KP Zana didn't start. Um, but with Higashioka... Really awesome backup catcher. He's a lot better defensively than Luis Campuzano is right now. I'm hoping he can get better, but in terms of the beginning, I am I am a little bit concerned. And I'm very concerned, especially with pitchers like like Cease, who can be a little bit, you know, like they can throw a lot of walks. You want to have a catcher that can be more consistent there. So I'm I'm wondering, I'm wondering if down the line you might see Higashioka catch for pitchers like Dylan Cease. Because you know, for a pitcher like him who could get a little bit wild with some of the walks, some of his pitches that just go straight into the dirt, you might want to have a better defensive catcher behind there for those games. But we'll see. We'll see. Because Campuzano's bat has just been so good so far, especially early on. And again, it's going to come down a little bit. His average exit velocity isn't great, right? It's just not. But based on what I saw last year, I'm still fairly confident, right? Like, yes, he's not going to be like a 300 batting average catcher. But I like what I'm seeing. I really do. So shouts to him. But then also in that inning, uh, what's it called? Uh, I still love that he had a ground out. And then bottom of the sixth inning, just to really put the game away, Jay Cronenworth hits a bomb. I've talked about him enough. I think that he's he looks like 2021-2020 right now. He is seeing the ball well. Hasn't drawn the most walks in, in the world, but nothing doesn't look legit. Um, and he's had games even where he smoked the ball and got unlucky. I've brought it up a lot of times, but that Cardinals series – and I bring it up a lot because it was like last week. You know what I mean? There's there's only so many games we have to talk about. Double play ball that he hit that kind of killed the entire momentum for the team. 490 expected batting average. Day after that, the second and third hardest hit ball, balls of the night that were out were from Jake Cronenworth. So he's also gotten a little bit unlucky. Think about that. That's how good he's been. And then right after that, we get a jerks and profar home run after Machado gets on base after a nice at bat. Um, that one was a little bit. A little bit more lucky than the others, uh, just a tiny bit. It was only expected to be a home run, and let's see if I can find it right here. 11 out of 30 ballparks, 250 expected batting average, so that was a little bit whatever. But bottom line, Profar, man, he's been awesome, and it's funny that, like, this is kind of... I'm wondering, like, is Tommy Pham just never going to sign with this team? Because maybe he's... Profar is playing so well that they're just like, we, we can wait. We'll wait on you, man. We like what we're seeing with Profar. I do think that... One thing I like that the team has done, I like it when they have a little bit of a lead that they bring in Jose Azokar. I actually like that because I thought that this guy deserved a few more at-bats last year. And with the defensive stuff, Profar is not as good there. Azokar is fast. So when you have a lead and you feel really good about it, I like that they can be like, we'll take out Profar and bring in Azokar for left field. That way, in theory, I think Merrill's been pretty good in center. You have a great defender in right field, obviously Platinum Gavlitter, and then you have a really good defender in left field. So... I think that's their thinking around that. I like the mix and matching on the defense. That's smart. And I really appreciate Schilt doing that so far. Cronenworth also gets an RBI single in this game. A Zokar squeezes one through. Um, I'm trying to find if he got uh, particularly lucky on that one. It wasn't that bad, actually. He hit it actually harder than I thought. 100.1 miles exit velocity. Not bad. Expect the batting average 400. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Very cool. Um, and then you get a Fernando Tatis Jr. single 
So that was really good to just wrap up the scoring. Um, a great way for the Padres to end the series. Unfortunately, they play the Dodgers next. And I'm curious. I've seen some reports that Jeremiah Estrada, one of the Padres' interesting bullpen reliever type of prospects in the minors right now, maybe he gets called up um, to face this Dodgers team, which is pretty rough. <laughs> Because that's not the team that you want to start against. So that starts Friday. Looking forward to that series. Um, And then they get the Brewers and then the Blue Jays and then the Rockies after that. All teams that aren't that bad. I wish we could get our, like, Rockies series, like, right now. Like, there's other times. I wish when the offense was really going through it. I wish we could do that. But unfortunately, we can't. Um, But... We have a little bit more to talk about in this episode, guys. We're going to talk really quickly about Tuesday's game. There's not too much to talk about it. More of the sentimental sense is what we're going to get into. And then I want to talk about the lineup and Grand Pauly getting sent down. So we're going to talk about that in just a second, guys. But before we do that, let me just take a quick second to talk about our good old homies at FanDuel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing as well. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every game right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed, guaranteed, ladies and gentlemen, guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose, bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to free throws, whatever you want, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We love FanDuel. Go check them out. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, after a quick old break, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. I'm in a good mood. Unfortunately, I'm about to be a little bit of a sad mood. Let's quickly talk about Tuesday's game in which the Padres lost 1-5. to five. Um, Here's the thing. Bad pitcher for the, the Cubs. Not a particularly impressive one. No offense to them, but Ben Brown, four and two-thirds, was fine enough. Padres looked dead in this game, and it was really frustrating. Machado actually gets um, a double and two hits in this. Maybe he's starting to heat up a little bit. I hope so. Kim strikes out three times. You get two strikes out from Cronenworth, but he's he can do no wrong at this point, in my opinion. Cronenworth it just looks so, 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 so good so far, guys. Um, but I think that with this game, it is it really epitomizes a lot of the fears on this team. It is early, though. I think that overall, if you had to grade the Padres' season, it's like a B-minus so far. Like they're, they're floating above water, but... A game like that is really frustrating. You have the biggest comeback you've had, in my opinion, since the Hassan Kim David Dahl, like, first month of the season last year. Don't quote me on that. Um, When they had the David Dahl ties the game with the home run, then Kim walks it off. Basically, since then, felt like there had been no fight in this team basically all year. And you had that last night. Third largest comeback in the history of their franchise. Really good stuff. Like, the history of their franchise. Like, back to the 70s and 60s. So, really, really great stuff from them there. Um, And then they follow that up by just getting killed. And it was a Joe Musgrove start, too. And Joe Musgrove struggles in this one, by the way. Um, Just not the best. He was good through four innings, though, which is interesting. In fact, he actually had, of that night, he had basically just one bad inning in which he allowed the bases to get loaded. But he had the fifth most swings and misses of any starter. Um, It was was on Tuesday. The fifth most, I think it was, I believe it was 16. And he basically just has that one bad inning, which is unfortunate because that's kind of like all it took. But he gives up the home run to Jan Gomes, of all people, who somehow is still in the league. I've heard that name for so long. Shouts to Jan Gomes still getting them checks, man. I've heard that guy since, like, 2013, 2012. Like, I've heard of this guy for the longest time. He's still killing it. So, shouts to him. And then you get the walk from Ian Happ, single from Suzuki. He hits Cody Bellinger with a pitch. Then they bring in Steven Kolek, who gives up the grand slam. Um, Kolek has been really hit or miss. Uh, so far, he's had a couple good moments. I think the, the series against the Cardinals, he went two innings, struck out three. That was pretty good. But he hasn't looked all that amazing. He's been, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if he if they are to call up Jeremiah Estrada, if at some point they bring up Wusak Go um, and he figures out some things down there. I would not be surprised if Colex gets sent down. It just, he has not impressed me so far. Um, and he is a young guy. Just, hey, there was some optimism for him, but this is also sometimes why you don't want to get too excited about those like tertiary, like past the top 10 prospects, someone like Alec, but hey, not that great for him. But Joe Musgrove basically just has this one really nightmarish inning, not the best start for him. And that was unfortunate, given that if you had to trust someone to follow up that Monday game and give you a good start the next day, you would choose Joe Musgrove, right? Like that would probably be the guy that we feel the most confident in because he is our, he's kind of our guy, right? So 
Shouts to him. Um, very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. And the only run that they get in this game is an Eggy Rosario home run uh, in the bottom of the sixth inning. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I tweeted about this last night. Um, I do not understand the Tyler Wade thing. And I've talked about this before probably a lot. My apologies for repeating myself, but what can you do? I don't mind that Tyler Wade's starting. He's got speed. He's got a little bit of something. He's been in some big moments, right? With the Yankees, he's been in some big moments. I appreciate that. Nice swing in the bat and all that. But I don't understand why a guy who has a career OPS of 595, he has never had a WRC plus over 94, and that only happened once. Only once. Otherwise, here's his WRC plus by year. 18, 30, 88. 69, 94, 55, 79. So like even the one year when you look at his slash line, 268, 354 on base, he only slugged 323 and he had a 94 WRC plus. That was like kind of his best year. I don't mind having him on the team. I actually think he could be helpful as like a pinch runner sometimes. Like say Campuzano gets on board late in games. Say Machado, especially right now. Like maybe you want to late in games. Maybe not Machado, but you get my point. Um, And that's just not what they've been doing. You know, Higashioka. And I don't, my thing is not, look, he started off strong. He had a good series against the Dodgers, but it's clearly like a lot more fluky than reality. My issue is why does he have a monopoly on this position? Eggy Rosario, don't get me wrong. Eggy Rosario has not been all that impressive, but I'd rather give him a chance. He's 25 years old and doesn't have a six year history of being really porous defensively. And believe it or not, he's got a 194 WRC plus right now. Now, granted, that's just across... 16 plate appearances, which which isn't a lot, and that can get inflated when you hit, like, a couple of really nice home runs. But I'm just saying, like, why do we have – it's Tyler Wade. This feels so similar to the situation they had with Luis Campuzano, where it's like, I get it. I get it. He's got some problems. But why is Austin Nola blocking him? You, why, you ain't got prime Jorge Posada. You ain't got prime Buster Posey. I don't know why I said Posada first. Um, oh, I was talking about, it's my mom's favorite player, for those who are curious. My mom's favorite player of all time is Jorge Posada. Um, you know, heck, Jonathan Lucroy back in the year, the day, whatever. I don't understand why he has such a monopoly. And with Manny Machado, we'll have to see, there's been these like reports about how, like, you know, maybe it's still affecting him, this injury and all that stuff. I don't understand why, if Machado's going to be back to playing third base, why are you using some of these infielders in a way that they just don't play very often? And Eggy Rosario, yeah, I know it wasn't like a high leverage situation, but just give the kid a chance. You know what I mean? Give the kid a chance. Last year, even. Last year, in a 106 WRC plus. Like, it's not that bad. Like, give him a second. Give him a second. And I know the strikeouts have been concerning, but my thing is, why can't we just give him like a few plate appearances? Now, I know that he's been struggling. The, the splits on him are really bad for his career. In fact, I'm going to pull them up right now. In terms of lefty versus righty, it's actually, it's, Forget night and day. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Mr. Hyde. Uh, he's got a 306 WRC plus right now in his career against lefties and a 12 WRC plus against righties. Now, in terms of the sample size, um, in terms of the sample size, uh, it's not great. Like I said, like in terms of righties, it's 36 plate appearances. Not great. Lefties, 23 plate appearances. But, okay, you want to do that? Then put Graham Pauly in against righties. Why does Tyler Wade get so much time? Now, maybe he's only going to get a certain amount of more time because it's slowing down. And in this game, Ofer, he, he goes Ofer again. He does draw a walk um, in Tuesday in Tuesday's game, I should say. But then he has a bad game the next day after that uh, where he, I believe he struck out twice. Let me see. Let me just bring that up real quick. Where you at, Wade? Yeah, he struck out twice, 0 for 4. He's down to 214. All right, you want a platoon, Eggy Rosario? Sure. I actually think he might have a decent glove, by the way, too, which is another reason why I want him at third base. Eventually, Machado is going to come back. And to me, a player like Graham Pauly could be that DH that really helps the Padres this year. But they just refuse to give him at-bats. They oh, Think about it. He had the home run off of Camilla Duvall. And then they gave him one at-bat. Or not one at-bat. They started him the next day. And that was kind of like the only time they started the guy. Why is Tyler Wade taking up all this? It remind, It's such peak Preller Padres management thing. I just don't get it. I'm fine with having Tyler Wade on the team. But wouldn't you guys be a lot more excited if it's like, all right, Eggy Rosario, he's weird, but like, he's young. He's 24. Let's give him a chance. You know what I mean? Have him hit against lefties and then have Graham Pauly hit against righties. 
Let's do that. Instead of trotting out a guy who, like I said, career OPS of 595. WRC plus over only over 94 once. And it's not like he's an ace defender either. You can't even say that. That it's the same thing as Austin Nola, man. Where it's like, if Austin Nola was Higashioka, all right. Like, I, I, I could at least be like, yeah, this guy's like a good defensive catcher, really good frame, all that stuff. What are we doing here? So that's really frustrating, and I'm glad that they sent him down if they're never going to use him. But if if Tyler Wade keeps hitting like this, which I think he will because he's never shown that he's going to be above this, and I'm not trying to be mean to the guy, but it's true. If he doesn't continue to be better, then why why wasn't it Graham Pauly there? I just don't understand. And it's not like Machado's out the whole season, and then we have time to field this out. Machado theoretically could be back at third base soon. So let's put the guy who's shown some decent defensive upside – and at least he hits against lefties. Let's make it more consistent. And then have Grand Pauly hit against righties. And by the way, Grand Pauly is good against righties and lefties in terms of his minor league career. What are we doing? Give the kids a second. I, I just, it's really frustrating. I'm glad that they sent him down only because if you're not going to play him, then why is he here? Let's give him some reps in AAA or whatever. But it's frustrating, man. I'm like, what are you doing? This, it's just inexcus- inexcusable. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Please leave a comment if you think I'm missing something on Tyler Wade. Like, please do. And I know that Eggy Rosario hasn't exactly impressed. But it's kind of hard to impress when you bat, like, once every six days. And if it's that, then it's like a pinch hit situation, right? Like, what what are we doing here? What are we doing here? I just don't understand it. So that, t- honestly, that to me is more frustrating to me than the 5-1 loss. I don't care about the 5-1 loss in a lot of ways. It was frustrating, but this is worse. I don't get it. I don't think it'll last much longer. To me, this feels very Runet Odor like, where Runet Odor got called up, former Ranger, uh, former stomping ground of AJ Preller. Maybe that's what's going on here, and it'll, it'll like he's just a fleeting moment, and we're not we're all going to be laughing about this in like two months after Grand Pauly's, you know, got a one ten WRC plus, and he's like not the best DH in the world, but he's doing good work for a rookie. Maybe we'll just be laughing about it, but until then, I don't get it. Leave a comment below if you have an answer, because I just don't. I really don't. But folks, with all that ranting and raving, that about does it for today's edition of the Locked on Padres podcast. The only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Go check out me on Just Baseball. Go check me out on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Or I've been tweeting a lot more about baseball, by the way. I think I just like to keep it to one account. Padres account, I will give you show updates. I will give you the main basic things. Poll, I like to ask you followers and whatnot, like for questions and all that stuff. So be, be sure to follow both accounts. Um, in terms of the future of the show, tomorrow I am planning on doing my first report card of the season, giving my grades, letter grades for everything that I've seen from the Padres to start this season. Um, lots to get into on that. Um, Going to be a really fun recap because tomorrow's an off day. And then we got the Dodgers series. Whether or not I do anything special for that remains to be seen. You'll just have to tune in to find out. But until next time. Everybody stay safe and, of course, stay faithful, my fire faithful homies. Take care.